hello, hello. Check one, two. I think I think I'm I think I'm live. I think I have audio. I think I can can see you all in the chat. I see a lot of friendly faces, people I recognize. What's up, Pavel? Simple Sam, Abdulaziz. Hope I said that right. Mike, Mike, with Meek, Mike. <clears throat> doing my best. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope everyone had a nice kind of chill weekend, holiday weekend, if it's a holiday for you. Um, I myself stepped out of the studio. Finally, uh, got some peace and quiet for a little bit. It's you know kind of rare to come by from some music producers. <laughs> So, yeah, cool. As we're coming into, you know, the end of the year here, uh, we have some cool stuff going on with 343. I'll mention it more as we go. Also, I'm sure you'll see uh, 343 posting about it in the chat here. Um, but we've got, let me see, let me make sure, make sure I got my information right. Uh, we got some special prices for our classes, um, which is our Cyber Week sale. You know, we got Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals pretty much still going on it's 25 percent off of all of our courses until this sunday the, the 5th so you got a little bit more time left to register for one of our classes if you're keen on joining us either here in the city uh, new york city or online or if you're in berlin you can always go and check us out over there as well um, the giveaway is a three-month subscription to splice so i'm pretty sure how that works is each month you're given a certain amount of credits so you don't have to pay for those credits for the three months and you can spend those on individual sounds loops presets anything that you might want um, splice is great you know gotta gotta love those guys um, yeah and i think that's pretty much all the housekeeping stuff to get out of the way um, today we're gonna do something a little bit different um, which you know you're gonna hear pretty often from here oh i lost the chat hold on let me get you guys back there we go uh which you're gonna hear pretty pretty uh, often from me that we're not gonna be doing the same thing twice i don't want to really recycle stream ideas until i kind of run out right um let's see today i bought impulse atlas 2 drum sample machine plugin that's cool i've never even heard of those there's so many different vsts and plugins out there these days it's all over the place right um yeah i was thinking maybe I would do like a buy a plugin bundle during Black Friday and then, you know, see what all the different uh, tools in there. And I got I got the Black Rooster one. I don't know, they have a couple of different old like analog modeled plugins, but it doesn't really give me enough to talk about and enough to do. So I decided to scrap that idea. Um, and so today we're going to be approaching something a little bit um, you know, different. I am going to be just writing music, so we're all going to have a good time there. But uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about like music theory and, and some some compositional things that we can maybe do. So this one might be a little bit more informational than my, my previous ones have been. <laughs> Hopefully that's good. You guys can learn something. Um, what's that synth on your left there? Um, well, there's sort of two. Uh, this is a Korg Vintage SV1, so it's electric piano. I don't know if when I play this, it streams into OBS. I don't think it does. Um, but it has a lot of like nice electric piano sounds on here, and then clavichord, regular piano, some strings, but it's mostly electric piano. Um, it has analog effects up here. So I've got like a, a tube amp that I can run this through. That's kind of off screen here. Uh, this up here is a Korg R3, which is a very, very old uh, synthesizer. Once again, I don't think you're gonna hear this if I play it through. Um, but it's actually a vocoder. It's I don't have a microphone plugged into this right now, but it's like a digital analog synth um, that works as a vocoder also. And they're both Korg. I am definitely a Korg fan boy. <laughs> Sounded terrible, but um, yeah, I'm I'm surrounded by a lot of Korg stuff. Uh, if they would like to sponsor me, I'm currently accepting sponsorships from Korg. Okay, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I like the stuff. I'm, I'm a piano player, so I needed something that had weighted keys, right? This feels like much closer to a regular piano than the MIDI keyboards, but it, it still functions as my MIDI keyboard, too. Um, all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's, enough, enough me, enough of my face, enough talking. Let's switch back to Ableton here. I don't know, my quick commands for OBS are all over the place. Uh, indeed, cannot hear it. I'll, I'll record some sounds in for you so you can get an idea of... What it's what it's about. What it's about. Oh, Atlas Two is excellent audio. Yeah, those guys are really solid. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Oh man, what <laughs> my YouTube is struggling here. Okay, there we go. We're in Ableton. Oh no, my uh, <laughs> my window. Okay, you're gonna see the streamer window for a moment, so I can move my face. So, streamer window. Uh oh. Uh oh. Moving the wrong thing. Okay. There we go. That's that should be all right. We'll give that a shot. Yeah, it should be fine. Okay, cool. Sorry. 
So um, today I wanted to talk about um, a few things, uh, some music theory like, um, you know, compositional choices, writing choices, um, and also some <clears throat> like meter and tempo stuff uh, that could be uh, cool to maybe incorporate into some of our music. I think, you know, a lot of our students, a lot of our community here is really focused on electronic music. I mean, if we look at the teachers and streamers we have, that's kind of what we're all uh, creating, right? And so a lot of uh, elements and writing tricks from you know different styles and genres sometimes don't really make its way, make their way into uh, what we do. So I think it'd be cool to take a look at some of those compositional choices we can make and see if maybe we can start to incorporate some of the stuff into our writing. You know, um, one of those things would be a different meter. You know, most of the music that we write and listen to is in four four. Um, if we think about music that's performed by a DJ, most of that all is really going to stay in that same exact four four meter so that it can be mixed on top of each other. Right? If we're mixing two different songs. With two different meters on top of each other, eventually things are going to slip out and when we're going to find ourselves in drastically different parts of the song, you know, when we're trying to make that mix. And so it does make, you know, live performance from a DJ's perspective a little bit more challenging. If we're thinking about something like house music, we have a drum following the pulse. And so if that, you know, resets itself in kind of like a strange rhythmic division, then it's not really going to have the same feeling as, you know, the house music that we listen to does. And so there's certainly, you know, genres and styles here that, you know, makes it harder for us to, to try and, you know, apply these things. However, um, what I think you'll find is that we certainly can throughout, you know, uh, different sections of our song, whether it's for a transition or just for like one little moment, uh, we can slip this stuff in there. So we're going to be diving through that. I'm going to play what I've put together here for us, and then we're going to make it different. So this is a electric piano chord progression and a acoustic kit from Contact doing the drums. I intend to make this a more electronic sounding piece of music so that I can show you that, you know, even in the more EDM leaning genres, we can still kind of get away with this stuff. <clears throat> is the keyboard counted? What is is the keyboard counted mean, Abdullah? You should have bought the Steam Deck. Oh, you mean the uh, the Steam Deck that plays video games from the company Steam by Valve? Yeah, I, I'm, I will maybe uh, pick up some some uh, uh, you know uh, MIDI keyboards or MIDI controllers for the for the OBS stuff. But for now, we're rocking with my uh, <laughs> Jerry rigged keyboard commands. All right, cool. So let's listen back to this so you can get an idea of what's going on, and then we'll break it down, talk about it a bit, and then we'll transition this into a more electronic sounding piece of music. So that's what we've got to work with. And there's definitely like a couple of strange things going on in this piece of music, for sure. For one, um, we have, um, <laughs> reminds me of some song. Uh, we have a couple of uh, meter changes here. So the beginning of the song is in a time signature of 7-4, which means that a quarter note gets seven beats, right? So if I'm counting one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's how we're going to be kind of sitting rhythmically in here, which means we need to do some strange things to get that to work, right? When we're so used to hearing music in four, four, and I guess sometimes three, four also, um, those off, you know, uh, odd meters that we're not as familiar with can get become really hard to feel nuanced and, and comfortable. And I think maybe the very first time you play through this progression, it feels a little weird, but after a couple loops, you, you kind of realize where those emphasis points are and it starts to make more sense but one way that we can look at a meter of seven four and maybe make it a little bit more simple is to break it into two different sections right so if we look at this midi grid we got you know seven quarter notes here in this one measure of space these are two measures here um, we can think of a measure of seven more like a measure of three in addition to a measure of four right three plus four is seven and so if we're you know using our our uh, uh, drum kit to try and force a rhythm into seven, it might be easier to split this up into two different chunks. So here's three, and then here's four. If we look at the four measures at the end, or sorry, the four beats at the end of this measure, it's kind of just a basic four on the floor drum beat, right? Kick, kick and snare back and forth. Like we're very used to this type of pattern here. Kick, snare, kick, snare repeat snare right and then the beginning these three we have kind of the same thing kick snare kick kick and then so we lose that extra beat you know usually the beat after this would be followed up by another round of this but we just kind of like chop that out and because of the fact that i'm emphasizing this beat pretty heavily and you know, we have an open hi-hat layering this kick drum and we have nothing in between it to really like drive home those downbeats it kind of resets your brain rhythmically right we hear one two three and then one two three four one two three one two three four so for us it's a lot easier to hear this type of thing right we're used to three four with things like waltz right waltz party waltz party waltz is perfect yeah um that's a great great uh you know description of that so there's a couple of different ways that we could, you know, shake this up. We could put the double kick drum at the beginning like this. And that's going to be more like that waltz fair, like dun, 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 right? So that's more leaning into triplets as well, which I'm not using. I'm still in a duple meter here, um, but that is pretty much what we're doing. So when you're going for odd meters, especially when you start adding those numbers up, like we're talking about like 15, eight, a meter of 15, eight, then breaking that up into smaller chunks makes way more sense, right? Because our, our brains don't really hold on to a rhythmic or a rhythm that has variation over 15, you know, quarter notes. Like that's a lot of rhythmic variation to get lost into. It's going to be harder to, to really get the audience member to hear where the one is, right? Where that rhythm restarts and kind of refreshes the pattern. Um, so that's one way that, that we are approaching that. However, later on in the piece of music, when we get to more, I guess you'd call it the chorus, we go back to 4-4. Four, four. And so we need to make a transition between 7-4 and 4-4, which oftentimes is not necessarily a challenge and doesn't really require like a ton of effort. You could just make the switch, right? The second that the new part starts, now we're in 4-4 and the listener, you know, based on how you compose this section, will be able to hear that catch on and, you know, feel the new rhythm. Um, here in Ableton, I'm using a locator. You know, we can right click and add locators here. One of these options is insert time signature change. Um, so if I do that, I can force the grid to shift to a 4-4 four, four grid for these parts <laughs> and then switch back to a 7-4 grid for these parts, which makes it a lot easier to see what's going on and keep myself organized uh, when we're going through these rhythms and making these changes. So that's not the only thing going on here rhythm rhythmically, though, and that's because of how we get back and forth between... Um, a 7-4 section and a 4-4 section. So we're doing something uh, that has a couple of different names. Um, I mean, the, the camera, the better way to uh, describe it is we're, you know, taking away a beat or adding a beat to just kind of like help, you know, things, uh, you know, feel like they turn over rhythmically uh, in, in time. Uh, another way to describe what we're doing here is called stealing time or or which which does kind of also constitute adding time as well um so if we look at this section here this is seven four so we have one measure here of seven four then another measure here of seven four then another measure here and then another measure here but look there's one extra beat before the four four section starts four four section starts right here but we've added one more beat here 
to kind of pick this back up. So I guess realistically, I could say I actually started the 4-4 section back here. Because look, we added a beat to our 7-4. But we didn't really change the rhythm of what was going on here all that much. We're still following the 7-4 pattern. We're just adding that extra beat at the end to kind of initiate the 4-4 a little bit ahead of time, right? And having this long pause here, like this chord is held for three beats. Nowhere else do I have a chord held that long except for in the transitions. It helps us bridge this gap a little bit. So really focus on how this turnaround works. We got one, two. Right. And so it kind of, you know, gives you a little preliminary understanding of how we're going to be shifting up this rhythm here. And because it, I do it with a pause, it almost feels more like I'm making an emotional choice to just slow down in that section. Right. How often do we listen to piano music where certain sections will be kind of sped up for like intense, you know, energetic effect and then slowed down to make them feel either like sadder or more down tempo and kind of like softer. Like we add these types of tempo and meter changes to that type of writing. <coughs> And without having to automate my tempo here, which is a pain, right? I don't want to speed up and slow down all this stuff by automating my tempo. That makes it harder to use Ableton with audio and things like this. Um, we can just do it by adding beats and measures here and there. So let's look at another place that I do this, which is when we go back from 4-4 four, four to 7-4. So this is a phrase of four measures in 4-4, four, four, right? So this is one measure, two measure, three measure, four measure. So we'll play through this part. Where the repeat happens right so this chord progression then repeats ah. right so here we're doing something kind of similar except this time we're just kind of adding an entire measure right so here's our whole phrase at the very end of that phrase, we add a new <clears throat> rhythmic progression for the turnaround chords so that we can kind of like start pulling you away from the part of the song that we were in before. Um, and we let the drums kind of slow down, fade out a little bit, right? But if we're looking at the meter here, this is still a set of four and a set of four that then just immediately jumps back into our set of seven. Because I have, again, this long held chord in this drum line that feels like it's slowing down, but really I'm just kind of opening the rhythms up a little bit, uh, with like dotted eighth notes and things. It, it kind of shifts you back into this, you know, seven, four here so that, you know, we don't get lost the second that the beat picks back up. Because this kind of suggests this emotional slowdown again that then, you know, resets your brain. It's like a palate cleanser, you know, meter wise for then going back to the 7-4 section. So this half of the song and this half of the song are copy pastes. They're it's just the exact same thing back and forth. But I wanted to be able to do that so that even when I go in and add variation to the second time around, maybe change the chords, change the instruments, etc. I know that this progression from going to the 7-4 back to 4-4, back to 7-4, back to 4-4 uh, works. So rhythmically, that's kind of the uh, interesting challenge I've applied to this piece of music as far as being, you know, an, an electronic song. However, we also have some things going on in the chords here that are kind of interesting to, you know, talk about here. So key wise, um, it, it's kind of a mess to, to break things down a little bit. So I'm not going to spend all my time talking about, you know, what's going on here, but there is a key change. And that's what I really want to focus on, because especially in electronic music, I see a lot of borrowed chords, but I don't see a lot of key changes and I don't see a lot of uh, meter changes. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here. The first chord is C major. But then the second chord is E major. <laughs> so if immediately, you know, you're looking at C major going, oh, first chord C major, we're in the key of C major. Well, E major has a G sharp in it. And that's not in the key of C major, right? Um, so we could think, oh, maybe I'm in a different key. Um, but if we start looking at some of these other chords, it can get, you know, potentially a little bit more challenging. Um, so the next chord is A minor. So that's in the key of C major. Pretty sure that's also in the key of uh, E major, though. So that doesn't necessarily help us out a ton. <clears throat> Actually, that's wrong. It's not in the key of E major. So this is what we're considering kind of a borrowed, borrowed chord here. <clears throat> 
and it really helps us just get to this A minor, right? E minor, E major to A minor sounds very royal and nice. And so up against the C major, which would otherwise have an E minor in it, right? So let me make this minor. Let me keep this to the key of C major and we'll hear how this now sounds. It still sounds fine. Like it sounds in key. But it's not nearly as interesting as making this major. So there's a couple of reasons why this work works. Hey, what's up, John? Um, we have cool chromatic movement happening within these chords, right? We have G into oops into G sharp with that E major chord into A. So that's a chromatic walk up. And we can kind of hear that in the way that the chords uh, move through it. Uh, simple sound borrowed chord is a chord from another key. Yeah. And so the reason why we would call that a borrowed chord instead of a key change is because I only just throw it in there once, right? We borrow a chord from another key and then we're the rest of the chords surrounding that borrowed chord are pretty much still in the key that, you know, I suggested at the beginning here, which is our C major. Um, yeah, well, if you check out a chord from the library, they're going to charge you for when you don't bring it back, right? So, <clears throat> so um, yeah, so eventually we will end up making a key change and the use of this chord might actually contribute to that but for now we're just you treating it like a borrowed chord and then if we look at the end here it goes to an f major to lead us back to the c major that's a four one that's like a incredibly common cadence right going from four back to one we hear that in so many songs it's very comfortable for us and so that's how we're completing our progression it's an f major chord that's in the key of c major for the most part we're really suggesting the, the key of c major here with with the twist right with with the twist um, so I repeat this. However, I do make a couple of adjustments in the way that I play it. Maybe. No, but I'll make one <laughs> with you guys because I wanted to originally. I just kind of forgot. So one thing that we can do with this E, uh, E major chord to really accent this A major or A minor chord is change the bass note, right? I have an E chord here and an E in the bass. But if you, you know, I've talked about this in some of my other streams, we don't really need to keep the bass note the same as the name of the chord that's a very you know root position standard thing to do it leaves us with less you know less options as far as how we make these chords feel and if we remember what was cool about this progression it's this chromatic walk up g g sharp a right and so what i want to do is outline that g sharp here that special note that doesn't really belong in the key here um and put that in the bass too right <clears throat> so we're going to take this E and move it up to a G sharp. However, I'm going to leave the E in at the beginning so we can really like feel the chord as it as it is. And then the second time around, I'll alternate so that this E becomes a G sharp and it makes the chord feel more like it has more tension, right? When we play a major chord with the root in the bass, it's very royal and big and uplifting. But when we play a major chord with the third in the bass, it kind of creates this almost like level of dissonance between the upper harmonics of that bass note and the actual chord being played. And that creates dissonance. And even though it's a minor chord, it still sounds good. Or sorry, a major chord, and it still sounds, you know, big and royal. It adds a little bit of tension to it. So that's a choice uh, that we can make here versus root chord versus third in the bass. Right. So listen to how this progression and this progression differ just because of this chord right here. So adds a bit of a uh, emotional change there, which is cool because when I layer this with heavier sub bass stuff, this gives me a new note to, to, to throw in there, which always feels good. So uh, we'll, we'll keep that change there. <clears throat> and then at the turnaround here, we have a little bit of stuff going on. So this is starting a new measure where we're missing some of the progressive the chords progressions, right? We have our C major chord into a E major chord, which I don't want to use the G sharp in the bass for. We could try it, but I think I'm going to put this back because that immediately goes into an F major. It doesn't hit the A minor. We skip the A minor altogether. Yeah, no, see this, this in the bass no longer makes any sense because there is no, this does not lead into F major. The G sharp absolutely does not suggest an F uh, major coming around the bend. So we're going to leave this in the E note because that follows the chromatic walk up from the E major to the F major, right? It's just a half step up. Nothing changes. Feels way better. So again, we skip this A so that we can give an emotional, you know, extent extension to this, uh, 
F chord. And the reason why we wanted to give an emotional extension to this F chord is because I wanted to kind of like trick you into thinking that F is where we're going to resolve this part of the progression. This is in C, right? So naturally it's probably going to want to go back to that C major chord, but I'm not going to let it do that. I'm trying to transition out of that C major key. And if we look at <clears throat> this chorus part, the first chord is a B minor. Right, it's a little inverted, but we got a B minor chord here, and so that's certainly not in the key of C major. Um, it's got a C sharp in it, so in fact, I would say it's fairly far away from the key of C major. Um, and so that's something that I'm trying to accomplish here, right? And the way that we can do this is by use of what we call a pivot chord. <laughs> Um, and without getting too complicated, it's just a harmony that's shared between the two keys, right? So C major has an, uh, an F major in it. B minor also has an F major in it, right? The fifth in a uh, key is going to be major all the time um, between the major and the minor keys. And so the fifth of B minor, sorry, B flat minor, I should be saying B flat minor. If I'm saying B minor, I'm screwing the whole thing up. Uh, B flat minor, the fifth is an F, right? And that means that F major is a pivot chord between the keys of C major and B minor, um, which means that when we use that F major, we have a much better chance of making this B minor feel a lot more natural, right? It doesn't feel very good to go from like a C major resolution, then immediately just play a B minor. And I can kind of show you that if I were to take this turnaround here and just make it a C chord, which is, you know, how this progression resolves. I don't, I don't want to delete what I just had, so. There we go. So, pretending like we're just resolving into a big C major chord, listen to how weird the beginning of this uh, chorus part sounds. Like, who, what? Who, who wrote this? Who's man's? So that's why we're holding that F down so strong. Now, let me actually consolidate these all together so we can see what this turnaround looks like, because that's also very important. Because when I play the F major uh, in, in this part of the song, we're still in the key of C major. Everything we've played up to this point has suggested that we're in the key of C major. And so this F major that I'm playing here feels like the four. Right, we're feeling it as a four. When I do the four, well, I can't. You can't hear that. I need to stop doing that. When you, when I play the four one, we hear that as being like our resolution. That four is not the thing to land on. It's the thing to get you back to the to the home base, right? And so when we play it this way, it's still not quite suggesting the B minor, the B flat minor, excuse me. Um, and so we need to do a little bit more to this chord to really lean into that B flat minor, which is why I'm hanging on the F major for quite a while here but look also at what the next two chords are that lead into this part of the song right this is and let me play this so you can kind of hear what we're referring to okay so let me play this in a vacuum let's pretend like the stuff before it doesn't really exist just hear how this enters and uh you know enters the actual uh rhythm here with these two quarter notes that feels very natural, right? To the point where I do it later on here, as as my um, as my uh, you know my cadence here, and so what is going on here? This is an F major chord. So the chord before it, same chord. I've just inverted it down because I'm going to be rising up to this B flat minor right here. In fact, let me consolidate these together for now, so you can see what it looks like. There you go. <clears throat> so. Here's our F major that we hang out on to kind of pivot ourselves from C major to B flat minor. Here's another F major, which is now me playing that at, on like a downbeat essentially suggests like, hey, we're really staying here and we're using this as a launching point. Then this is an F major with the third in the bass. So remember what we were doing with the E chord earlier on in our progression? We were alternating between the root in the bass and the third in the bass to give that chord tension, right? So instead of F major feeling very happy and royal, like it's supposed to in C major, right? Because of how that cadence feels is very natural and happy. Putting the third in the bass in that F makes it feel less like C major because that adds tension to what otherwise would usually be a very major feeling harmony in that key. And so that 
transitions us into our B minor chord very well. Look at what note that ends up becoming. The third of an F major chord is an A. That's the note right underneath a B flat, right? And so that's a very natural, like that chromatic step up. We've been doing that throughout the whole song up to this point. So you're used to hearing that type of movement. And it, it very well transitions our F major chord into a B minor chord. It suggests a, um, a diminished chord, right? It's not a diminished chord, but it suggests us playing one. And I could show you that. Look, if I put this F on the top, still sounds good. But watch, if I move this down to a D sharp, which creates our diminished chord, our A diminished chord, listen to how this drops back in too. Totally fine. I could have absolutely stuck with that as well. However, um, we, you know, we wanted to really force this F to become our pivot transition, which is why I'm keeping this an F major chord instead of that A diminished chord. But you can see how close F major and A diminished are. If I wanted to get maybe a little fancier, we could just make this an F dominant seven chord. If I add that D sharp that was part of this A diminished before and leave the F as our big finish, this right here, F dominant seven with our third in the bass. So this is gonna give us both that diminished harmony and the major harmony with the, you know, the shifted bass note to give us tension, which leads into the F. This might be too much, but. So there you go. I'm gonna take this out because I like what we had before, but you can see what some of these options we have are as far as getting back and forth. Um, so sorry, I've been ignoring chat a little bit. Um, thank you for holding it down for me, everybody. Uh, Yellow Wolf asking me to uh, react to a song. We actually have like a whole section um, of our our uh, like our program, our, our community 343 that is for that exact same thing. Um, we do have a call-in show. I don't know if it's running right now, but there is a particular stream that I think is specifically for that kind of track feedback. But we're also testing... Um, like a, a whole separate section on the website where you're able to join zoom classes and get feedback. So, um, look out for that in the future for sure. Um, <clears throat> but you know, also our discord, our discord is probably going to be the best place for you to get feedback from both teachers like myself and other, other, uh, instructors here at three, four, three, and also students alike. Cause a lot of our students who've gone through a lot of these courses, hang out in that discord and share their knowledge with some of the newer, uh, newer students. So, um, I think that's, you know, probably going to be your best bet for sure. Unfortunately, I can't take the time today on the stream to do it, but, um, yeah. Yeah. I see Pavel, uh, suggesting the discord channel is he's the right, he's the, he's the right guy. He's the right guy to, uh, to look at. All right, cool. So yeah, while while we're here, we're kind of like you know, halfway through this. I've kind of you know explained what we're listening to here and what's going on. Um, sub one cadence that we need to kind of take a look at. Uh, I want to remind you guys that we've got our three four three uh, holiday cyber sale, cyber week sale going twenty five percent off of classes up until Sunday the fifth. Uh, so don't forget about that. Also, we've got three month splice subscription membership giveaway. So do those. I'm pretty sure John announces those winners at the end of the week. Just wanted to remind you, you know. All right, so we have one more little transition cadence. Um, it goes between our B minor chord progression, which you know I can take a look at if you want to, um, and our uh, C major progression again, right? So if we look at uh, this this kind of rotating chord progression here. Look at what the last chord in the progression is. Well, this is missing a note, funny enough. So we have an F major with an F in the bass, and then we have an F major with a A in the bass. So that's the third in the bass. So that's our turnaround. We're using that F major that we used to even get to the key in general throughout the new progression because that really keeps us from getting too far away from C major, right? We're coming, excuse me, it's disgusting. Uh, we're coming back to it eventually, right? And so we really don't want to um, you know, stray too far away. It's going to make it harder for us to, to come back to that C major chord, which I'm telling you is not going to be easy anyway. And you can, you heard when I played this track originally that the choice I made is not necessarily the one. So maybe, uh, we'll come up with some better options here before I start swapping out some new instruments. So listen to how this transitions back from our four, four B minor section to our seven, four C major section.
See, it's very surprising. Uh, and it feels very kind of off. This chord definitely sticks out, like kind of like a sore thumb. If I play this in a vacuum though, like listen to just these two chords leading back into the C major. That feels great. So in a vacuum, this this you know cadence transition does kind of work out a little bit, um, but it's definitely not feeling right as far as you know coming from this B minor section. So I think we should zoom in, take a look at what we can do to this chord right here to better transition us between B minor and C major. Um, now, one thing that we could do is see if there are any other pivot chords, or uh, as Simple Sam would call them, liaison chords, which I actually like <laughs> a lot better. Um, between B flat minor and C major, right? F major might not be the only one that exists between the two. In fact, I gotta believe there are in fact others. Um, one example of which would be a D minor, or I'm sorry, not a D minor. That's that's quite, quite incorrect. Um, hmm. Without having to plot all the notes down, because I don't keep the overlaps in my head between keys, I'm looking at it. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not seeing off the top of my head an obvious one. Um, we do have some things that are not too far off, though. One example would be an A major chord. Now, an A major chord is not in the key of C major. However, an A major chord kind of works in the key of C major, depending on what you're doing, um, which, you know, is, is an option. So we could maybe take a look at something like that. <clears throat> so we are coming from an F major. So an F major into an A major is probably going to sound a little strange, but just for, you know, the sake of learning, we're going to give it a shot. Oops. Whoops. <laughs> I'm a mess. How did I turn down the velocity of that like that? I didn't even, I had one hand on my mouse. Okay. A major. See, it's very, very strange. Um, however, sometimes strange can work because we are getting from here, right? And that makes a lot more sense. So this might be an instance where we want to ditch this F chord because it's holding us too much in the uh, the key that we're trying to get out of. Um, however, the way that I want to get from A major to A minor to C major again, because again, A minor is the, the, the chord in C major, um, going A major to C major feels fine. Bam, bam, right? It's not too far off, but they think there's a trick that we could use to to get away with this a little bit more easily. Um, so I'm going to even add one more chord here, see if I can with rhythmically, or else this might might get in our way a little bit. And we're gonna go from A major to A minor, which is weird, I promise, but I think it's gonna work out. <clears throat> And one way that we're going to do that is by putting the third in the bass, the third of the minor key, mind you. So this becomes A minor now, which guess what? It's a C. So we're going to put the C in the bass. And we're going to add the sixths to it as well. So that's going to be the sixth scale degree of our A chord. Um, an A minor sixth or a just any minor sixth chord with the third in the bass has kind of like this cool sort of tension uh, to it that oftentimes will allow you to play said chord before or after, excuse me, the major version of that chord. So we can hear how this transition works between these two chords. Um, one of the problems here is this doesn't necessarily suggest we land on a C, it kind of actually suggests we land on a D. Um, which is fine. If we wanted to, we could at this point do another key change um, and it wouldn't necessarily be too hard. We could pretty much just highlight our entire progression here and shift it up to a D, right? I said it wanted to land on a D major, so here we are. Right, and so that takes us elsewhere, but that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, cool to note that it works though. Hello? Oh, I shifted the wrong thing. Right? See, this just doesn't work at all. 
So we're going to get rid of this F major chord because again, that was really holding us back into this key. And maybe we'll actually just, oops, shift this rhythm around. So skip right to our A major and then in our A minor. Six, which I forgot the six. It's up here waiting for us. And I don't want to spend too much time finding a cadence here. Right? It's very much like a palate cleanser. It, it resets what we're hearing so that when we go from here. Without feeling too out of place, right? So that would be another option that we have here is trying to use like a major minor switch with a pivot chord or with what's close to a pivot chord. Um, but again, not necessarily working out in, in the way that we would want to. Um, so if we go back to our, our F major, which I think is probably still going to be um, the way that we're going to want to handle this. What we could think about is what goes in between an F major and a C major that feels kind of like a cadence or a transition. Um, and the answer to that question is a couple of things for sure. Um, but if we look at con common cadences, you know, I have like two, five, one, four, one, four, six, one. And so um, to me, that suggests maybe that we would want to add a six here. A six and C is an A minor. So again, we're just kind of like skipping, skipping ahead to that a minor chord, not even using an A major, but because there is an A major in the key of B flat minor, um, it's probably going to not seem too far away, right? Whenever you see that close of an overlap, even if it's just like the difference between a major and a minor chord, two of those notes are still the same. The one and the five between a major and a minor chord are the same, which means that even though contextually it might seem a little bit weird, um, it's going to be closer than, you know, a chord that's potentially just completely uh, different there. So um, the only thing I have to do to make this a minor is shift the bottom note of our F down to an E and put this on the bass note we want. So that's <clears throat> this strange sort of, uh, what is this, a G sharp major or an A flat major. Well, there's that. And then down to the F, which brings us the ability to immediately shift this up to a minor now. And because of the inversion here, our top note stays the same, which I think in this instance is bad. Sometimes this would allow these chords, even though they're kind of different from each other, to end up working out. But I think we want some melodic movement on the top of this chord here. Right? That's kind of wanting to go back up to our, our uh, B minor as well, to be fair. Let's see. Yeah, that's definitely where that wants to go, right? And that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, we want to get this to a C major chord. Right, which it still does, to be fair. Um, but maybe not in the way that we're looking for. One other thing we could try is putting a four in the bass, which I will try. So if I copy this and we shift this up five notes, one, two, three, four, five, that's the four which gives us a much more sort of like jazzy variant of this uh, minor chord. It's kind of a similar thing to the minor sixths with the third in the bass, but it's a little bit less, there's a little bit less tension there. Um, also works out if you want to add the seven to this chord, but I think that's just too, too harmonically rich. And that feels a little bit better. Again, this chord does kind of want to land us on a G instead. And so, um, you know, considering that this, this, dum, 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 that's kind of like where we want to land, not on the C. That's the, that's the fifth of C, right? So we could just shift all this stuff down to a D if we wanted to, <clears throat> which is going to give us the landing on our C. However, is it going to lead from an F to a D uh, minor? Well, I think the answer is yes. Oops. Too low. All right, so I think this is where we're going to stop <laughs> this, uh, for some of you, probably fairly painful experience of me finding our, our unique chord transition for the two key changes. Here. Cool. 
So the big reason why this is still not really working out, the cadence transitions us back to C major very well. It's just we have big jumps happening. These are pretty low, these are pretty low, and these are pretty high. And so the, the correct answer there is to create some inversions here so that we're not making such big jumps. And also this is just in a weird spot. We want to keep following that rhythm. See, and that feels a lot better for sure. Um, we could potentially, again, do the same thing we did last time and think about swapping this F out with something else that transitions us from G sharp to D minor, right? But again, I don't want to mess with this for too long, so I'm just going to leave this. Okay, so we made some changes throughout what we were doing here. So I'm going to copy old new MIDI over old MIDI. Boop, there we go. Um, and I would like to play through this part up, up to the halfway point once. And then we're going to talk about how we can shift this composition into an actual style of music. Because right now, stylistically, this is fairly ambiguous, right? It's pretty much just a piano tune with a little metronome in the background via a drum line. Otherwise, nothing really particularly stylistic is happening here. So I do like this more than what we started with, but if I was to, to be, you know, putting this song together for my own personal music project, I would be zooming in on this cadence to figure out, you know, where, where harmonically this wants to go. Um, I was just kind of showing you some, some different alternatives that we could have here, right? Okay, so let's think about actually, you know, pulling this, uh, you know, composition apart and turning it into, you know, an actual piece of, you know, music. So I'm thinking just because of the speed here, and kind of the, the style of uh, 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 chords. Um, it feels a little bit like Glitch Hop Future Bass-esque era to me. And so that's probably how we're going to you know do this. It also is a genre that has a broken beat, which means that I'm going to be able to kind of mimic rhythmically what's going on in the drums uh, with those sounds um, all the same. So that's pretty much what we're going to do. And at this point, you know, I'm, I'm just going to kind of talk my way through uh, about how I'm, I'm thinking about this. We're going to work on it for 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll probably use this next time if I don't have something else that I want to do particularly with the stream. So this can be kind of like a maybe a bit of a longer form project that we work on together. Uh, if you guys like it, depending depending on how it goes. <clears throat> so um, when I'm writing for a specific genre, oftentimes I'm trying to get some things out fast, right? In which case you might see me use like presets that I make small tweaks to um, or design like a very simple synth that, you know, doesn't necessarily sound quite right right away. But I start want wanting to get ideas down um, on the board. And so that's really where we're going to start here. Um, I want to think also arrangement wise. Um, and so one thing that is going to get in my way is these uh, <laughs> markings up here, the, the flags that give me our key change switches, because if I take this and I highlight and move it over, look at all this stuff that gets all messed up. Like it just shifted this to four, four, and this is four, four again, it added a new marker and like seven, four is like all gone now. It's a disaster. Um, and so <laughs> in this instance, I'm going to delete these for now. I was using these to show you guys what we were doing, where these things happened, and so the grid was right, but this is going to make it a lot easier for me to actually create this song uh, without those. Now, another thing to consider is our section that's in 4-4 four four is all messed up now. <laughs> um, and also this needs to be included with this clip because that's a, that's a mess. So this is where our 4-4 four four starts and we're just gonna have to pretend, right? The grid is still in 7-4, I'm not gonna make the switch here. So just, you know, pay attention to where your cuts are, where the lines are and where the rhythmic variation happens because that'll help you keep in time even though my grid is no longer. 
So sometimes I will just trial and error, make a chord, how to find out what it is. Is it just a lot of chords? Do you recognize a chord you've been inverted? Um, yeah, so a, a chord has a very specific name. And when you invert it, it stays the same. So, you know, a C major chord in root position, C on the bass, then E, then G. If I take that C in the bass and move it up an octave, so now E is in the bass, then G, then C, that's still a C major chord because it has a C, an E, and a G in it. Um, if a chord has a C, an E, and a G in it, it has to be a C major chord. There's no other, I mean, there, you could add notes to it and then add more names to it, like C major 7, C major 9 flats, you know, like you can do that, but it's still a C major chord. Um, and that's because of the C, the E, and the G. The second you shift one of those notes to a different note, like maybe you take that E and put it on an F, that is no longer a C major chord. It cannot be a C major chord because it has to have a C, an E, and a G in it. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how you know, the, the, the chord, chord naming conventions work. Um, what's cool about Ableton is we don't really need to worry too much about how we name a chord, right? We just need to focus on our ears, um, and the pattern in the MIDI. Um, but yeah, it's helpful for, for communicating for sure. Um, okay, cool. So I want a sound effect. I want like a, a little like soft, um, kind of like background ambient sound uh, to to start our song with because I want to start with kind of like a soft uh, filtered pad coming in and I need something filling the space that's not just a filtered pad because that's going to seem very small and empty. So here I'm going to go into Omnisphere. We all love Omnisphere. It has a textures soundscape list here so I can just kind of browse through this and find oh, an ambience that I like. super weird i i'm gonna go again we can always change this whenever we want but i'm just going to uh pick things for speed um and i'm gonna leave it on a c note but recognize that you know our velocity here and our our octave is going to make a big difference on how this comes across um, i'm also going to shift some stuff down i really want my song to kind of fade in over time Don't forget that, you know, we're trying to suggest a feeling of seven, which at the beginning is not necessarily going to be super easy, but that's okay. Actually, you know what? In fact, we're just going to duplicate time here. So I have another round of, well, another round of this. And that's how we're going to start. There we go. Okay, so Simple Sam says, but if you add extra notes, like you mentioned, then it can also be another chord. Yes, and it gets a little bit nuanced <laughs> when when you're doing this because it depends on kind of like your, your what ends up being your root harmony. So here's an example of what I was talking about, Simple. Um, this is a C major chord. I said, this is a C major chord, right? If I add this note to it, it's a C major six because we're adding the six to a C major chord. If I put this C note up here, it's still a C major six because this bit is our C major chord. And then this note right here ends up being our added six, right? Um, if I shift this up here, it's a C major seven because we added you know the seven here. If I invert these up, it's still a C major seven because all of these specific notes exist in the chord here. Here's where this changes though. If I add an A down here, Right now, the way that this chord is plotted out, let me get rid of this B. The way that this chord is plotted out, this is not a C major six, even though I have an A in it, just like I would call this a C major six like this. Putting this down one suggests an A minor seven. And the reason for that is because this harmony right here is gonna be very strong. The A minor in this chord is going to dominate the C major harmony in this chord. When I put the A up here, the C major harmony is going to dominate the whole chord. So this feels like a C major chord, and so we're going to call it a C major chord. This, however, feels like an A minor chord. So we're going to call this an A minor chord. I know it's like really kind of confusing for sure, and it's also going to depend on the key you're in also, mind you. Let's assume that the key I'm in has a C major in it, but it doesn't have an A minor in it, right? Which is kind of like a weird thing to exist. But if the key I'm in doesn't have an A minor in it, I'm probably still going to call this a C major six just because it's going to be easier on like notation paper, right? If I'm explaining this to somebody via keys and scale degrees, you know, not calling this an A minor seven is going to, to make more sense because there's not supposed to be an A minor in the chord um, or in the key, excuse me, in which case, you know, it's a C minor, a C major six with the six in the base, right? O over A, C major six over A is the way that you would call that. Um, however, if I'm in the key of, you know, 
B minor, A, A minor, name it, E minor, D major, whatever. It's I'm probably going to refer to this as the uh, A minor chord because not only is that in the key, but it's the dominating harmony, right? It really dictates how this chord feels. Um, I should totally like you know demonstrate the, the the sonic things I was just explaining there. So here's oh, so here's and the bass note is going to make a huge impact here. So I'm going to add one to prove it. So here's C major six with a C in the bass. -da 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 -da. It sounds happy. It sounds like a C major chord. We really hear this when I play this, right? I'm going to put this in the bass. Okay. I've inverted my C major six, but I still have a C in the bass. So it's still going to feel like the bam, bam, like it kind of a lot more like happy, except now we have some conflicting, you know, clusters here. Watch what happens when I shift this to the A though. Well, that's definitely this chord, right? This becomes our added note. So even though this A minor seven has a C major harmony in it, that's not what our brain focuses on. That's not how we hear the chord. And so this would be an instance where this C major six becomes an A minor seven. Um, little, little, little strange for sure. Like, how do I know C major seven augmented? So, so just another chord made from extra notes. Oh, yeah. Um, and so once you get into jazz chords, like augmented sevens and, you know, add nine, flat three, like there's there's things that it's just like it's nuance. It's whichever the person who composed the song decided to go with. Now, there is probably a the right answer there, but because of how all over the place it can become, um, it, they usually just pick whatever they think is going to be the easiest to understand. Um, like let's assume you would not know the key you're in. So at that point, it just becomes about the dominating harmony, kind of like what I said here. So not knowing the key I'm in, you know, if, um, the chord is, if the key is this or the chord is this, I have a C in the bass and I have a C major harmony up here. I pretty much hear a C major, even though, you know, somebody who was in a key would maybe write this as C major over A or, you know, C major add six or A major over or A minor over C actually would be another way to write this. A minor seven over C, right? So either way, I'm going to be able to figure out what the chord is. And so don't necessarily worry too much about like what the name should be. Um, just go with ever, whichever one is easiest for you to, you know, assume to come up with, because that's going to be the easiest one for other people as well when you kind of explain it to them. Um, yeah, traditional music theory overlapping with modern like music production practices gets kind of crazy because we have so much that helps us skip steps, you know, like if I wanted to take a progression and transpose it up to a new key and like add interval in yeah, intervals to this or sorry, uh, inversions to this and stuff back in the day, you'd have to like throw your whole sheet music book away and get a new book and like redo the whole dang thing from the beginning. But for us, it's like highlight shift highlight shift like it's it's so easy to do these things that would otherwise be you know very tedious back in the day um so we kind of lose some of the communication there because just because i can hit shift up with my arrow it's so easy we don't even need to really name what that thing is it's just you're changing notes right uh, but anyway it does help all right cool so i only got a little bit of time left um what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up our intro we're gonna start the, the intro we're gonna find a cool intro synth for these chords and then i'm gonna probably end the stream here um i i like this and i think this would be a good track to um continue working on next time uh it kind of depends on how many more we have until the holiday i should have two more streams before we go on break maybe even three so i want to remix a christmas song too so we'll, we'll see <laughs> um all right so i don't like this atmosphere anymore Change my mind. Let's see what else we got. Sick. So, mind you that this atmosphere is very tonal, right? We're playing a note. It's got a note going. So, there's a couple ways I could do to make this less tonal. I could find the note in EQ and just cut them, right? I could just get rid of them. And that leaves kind of like the upper formants and the texture of the sound to like really fill the space, which means I'm going to be able to more easily get away with playing chords over this. Um, or we could force this harmony to become very dissonant by doing something like this. In which case, there's so many harmonies in it that we're not necessarily going to hear, you know, the note in the key that it was playing before. Um, I want something less tonal. So, okay. I thought the idea of, okay, wait, there we go. That's better. Still kind of has a tone. Um, 
but yeah oh man christmas song music theory i don't know if i have like the brain power to (laughs) get through the music theory of a christmas song because some of them are just like basic classical music progressions and some of them are wildly complicated like very impressive composition stuff um so we'll see all right this is a better uh noise escape is a better atmosphere for me i want to just like hold this out because anytime you restart the note it has that little bit of attack so we'll just let that kind of ride have I listened to Cascade's Christmas album? I have, and it's absolutely fantastic. That's a really good shout out. So if any of you guys have not heard Cascade's Christmas album, go check it out because it's not what you would expect from Cascade. It's very good. Um, <clears throat> and not to say like Cascade is bad. It just doesn't sound like Cascade's other tracks. <laughs> um, yeah. Also, I'm probably saying their name wrong. I feel like I remember being told it was not Cascade. It was like Cascada or something. I don't know. I'm an idiot. Don't listen to me. Um, okay. So I'm also going to grab another Omnisphere to find at least something that works a little bit for these chords here that I can start to uh, filter in over time. So now we're at the point where I can kind of mute our piano track. Here. Woo. And that seems to be a little bit low on the register. Shift everything up an octave. Might as well just merge before I do that. Save me a move. Oh, thanks, Bill. I appreciate the uh, the kind of words. <clears throat> all right so again i'm looking for like a pad probably oh and again i'm going to change this this is great look it's called adagio it's hard i like the braid and the worn one warm ones so let's use both right omnisphere is pretty pretty intense so we're going to choose warm for this i'm going to go to number two and we're going to choose the bright version uh hello <laughs> what what where'd it go this is not okay i was gonna say this is not in alphabetical order anymore uh and in order for me to get both of these to come out at the same time i need to switch the output channel here on the extra to be just be the same so now i have both the warm and the bright strings i don't have to choose one i'll run with both <laughs> I really like how that skips some of the notes just because the attack on the uh, string takes a little too long to really get them out in full. Uh, it means I'm not giving away too much too early. Uh, this also gives me a really good opportunity to add our filter, right? So we'll let this start coming in. I do want to have like a little bit of time before it starts where it just plays our little sound effect. So I think that could be cool. And then, oops, we're going to add our filter here. Right, okay. So I'm going to treat this whole entire beginning kind of like this orchestral instrumental section. And then once the drums come in here or maybe a little bit down the line, we're going to go through like a really big shift. We're going to we're going to like cut a lot of the reverb tones out. It's going to be very dry in your face, very electronic drums. Um, so that is my plan for for this. So we'll hold on to this for next time. I'm going to add a marker here to help me remember. Uh, go EDM mode here. Oh, no, I hit my... <laughs> OBS buttons. I'll get the stream deck, all right? I'll 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 do it. I'll do it. You can't make me, but I'll do it. Um, so, all right, yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go here. Um, it was a good stream today. I appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys for, uh, you know, sticking through the whole thing and interacting with me and asking good questions, as always. Much appreciate. Uh, much appreciated. So, don't forget, you know, we got a physical location here at the school or here, sorry, here in the city, New York City, also in Berlin. So if you're interested in joining us for in-person classes, I teach a lot of those, but we have a lot of other fantastic tr- uh, teachers who some of which stream, you know, so you're familiar with some of them already, um, you know, reach out to us, check out our website for our um, 25% off class sale, which is going until the 5th, which is Sunday. So you still got a little bit of time on that. Uh, the giveaway, once again, is a three-month subscription to Splice. So you're going to get some free Splice credits if you win that one. You know, always good stuff uh, on that website. So definitely take a look at that. Um, otherwise, you know, just 
was fun hanging out today. I'm going to catch you guys next time for sure. Um, and otherwise, I will see you later.